welcome back to La Cancha, guys. The World Cup actually won through, threw out lots of surprises. There were some tweets early on that described the World Cup as being pedantic, being boring, being easy to describe. Teams like South Korea, Iran shouldn't be in the World Cup. Japan should be in the World Cup. Maybe they were right about Iran, but we saw some big upsets, didn't we, Oscar? Yeah, really big upsets. The main two being Saudi Arabia, absolutely turning the world and history around by beating Argentina, who won a 36 match winning run, and nobody saw this coming at all. Yeah, no like, one saw this coming because mm -hmm. in the first half, Argentina should have been up by four goals, if not exactly. for that fight. <laughs> Although one of those offsides, we still don't know about it. But in any case, the point stands Argentina were really, really good in the first half. And then the second half, or rather towards the end of the first half, Saudi Arabia started looking like they were growing into it. And then the second half, they just blitzed Argentina. Yeah, those first 10 minutes were some of the best football I've seen from a non-European side in the World Cup. Yeah, and, and, even, and even the win, eventual winner was just a classy goal, like, you that you associate the likes of Neymar scoring. Yeah, you know he used to play in La Liga for Villarreal. Yeah, he used to play for Villarreal. Well, so why he's in play loosely? <laughs> he only played one game and he came as a substitute at the last game of the 17-18 season against Real Madrid. So yeah. the word play where he's in very <laughs> useful for Salem Aldaswari. Yeah, very <laughs> I hope I said it right. No, nah, no, nah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. We <laughs> in this podcast take our pronunciations very seriously. And with Saudi Arabia, though, like they defended so well, the goalkeeper was insane. Yeah, uh, Luis was really, really good in goal. And I don't know. I just want to give Saudi Arabia that view. It wasn't like a defensive part of the boss performance. Like in midfield, they like dominated Argentina at times in the second half. And I think this is a trend we're going to discover as we look through these games, especially with bigger country versus underdog country, where is it like most of the games were games of two halves, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, and let's give a bit of credit for Herbert Renard, who's coaching in Saudi Arabia. We know him from African football. He's mm -hmm. done great things for Ivy Coast. He's won the African Cup there. He brought Morocco to the World Cup. Last time around, and they were super impressive. I felt they were a bit unlucky to go out against Spain and Portugal. Mm -hmm. And now he's proven himself to be a top coach again at this stage. How big of an opportunity is this for Saudi Arabia to make it to the next round? Because we we're going to allude to the Poland-Mexico game. And as we saw them, they weren't as good. They weren't that impressive. Yeah. And... The thing is that there's a stat that says if you win your first game, you have an 84% chance of progressing to the knockout stages. Wow. And they did that, and they won their first game beating the toughest team in the group. So even a point in either of the two games left might be enough, depending on how things go. But yeah, this is a huge opportunity for Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it is. And now we've spoken about the greats of Saudi Arabia. Let's it's time to whip some asses with Argentina because that second half performance from their point of view is unacceptable for a team that many people see as a favorite to win the World Cup. Yeah. There were, like, I don't want to pick on some players, but definitely the whole team didn't cover themselves in glory for the defending, for the goals, the lack of energy shown by the whole team in general in the second half. Granted, they got better like after 60 something minutes and they tried to use Di Maria's flank to create something, but there was just no cohesion in terms of breaking into the box at the right time. So, definitely, I feel like this is a huge wake up call for Argentina and San Paoli. Is, why am I saying San Paoli? Oh, this PTSD <laughs> <Scaloni>. from 2018. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Scaloni. Uh, yeah, Scaloni definitely has to look at making some changes. One thing, I'm sorry, one more, one thing I felt was off about Argentina when I looked at the lineup was the average age. Like, it was 30.5. I know there's some outliers like Messi and Di Maria, but those 
unnecessary outliers. Yeah. Someone like Papu Gomez hasn't had the best season, and I feel like he could have started Acuna, Guido Rodriguez, or even Enzo. So, I, and I also feel like um, Lissandro Martinez deserves a start in the next game. So these changes could go a long way to make Argentina look solid again. Yeah, they, they definitely could. And I also question the wisdom of starting Molina, who hasn't had a great season. Mm-hmm. Same with Papu Gomez. Uh, Di Maria looked very slow. Like Argentina just looked very pedantic in the second half. They looked very one paced. Mm-hmm. And um, I also wonder if Julian Alvarez would have been a good introduction to start the game because he's done so well for Manchester City. He's in good form. And maybe mm-hmm. you can put Messi as a number 10, the same way Griezmann was for France. And you can put Lautaro and Alvarez as the two forwards. Yeah. You also have to feel like there's a Celso shaped hole in that midfield because the Celso brings a lot of energy, right? Yeah. And the fact that Paredes hasn't had the best of seasons at UV, I feel like. And also the Paul, too. So these players for Argentina haven't had the most stable season so far. And I feel that may have showed in the first game. But hopefully, from an Argentina fan point of view, they this has woken them up and they take the game against Mexico on Saturday very, very seriously. Yeah, and that game against Mexico will be a party vassal. But Mexico didn't really show us any sort of quality in that game against Poland. Apart from Ochoa, who made a magnificent save against Lewandowski in that penalty. Did you expect Lewandowski to miss that? Because we've grown accustomed yeah. to him in Barcelona being so clinical, although he did miss yeah. his last penalty against Almeria. Well... It's not like I expected him to miss. I wanted him to miss. <laughs> <laughs> Expecting and wanting someone to miss. So, and it pained me in my heart. I'm like, Larry, I'm sorry. But <laughs> but for Argentina's sake, you have to miss this. This has to be a draw. Yeah, it's not doing the Lemon Disney stereotype any favors there. Yeah. And honestly, I don't think either team did enough to win the game, in my opinion. Yes, there were some dangerous moments in transition, but all those moments were just falling flat by bad decision making in the final third. So, they still really have a lot to work on. Yeah, they really do. And we made a joke last week that given the problems that Mexico and Poland were having, yeah, this month, that maybe, but Saudi Arabia would Saudi take Arabia advantage would take of them. Of them. Yeah. And we were we were half right, but then. <laughs> I mean, who knows? They might as well just beat all three and win the group. That will just be shocking. Yeah, it will be. That will break so many people's brackets. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of breaking brackets, what happens if Japan goes through? Because they did beat Germany and they look very enthusiastic. And as you mentioned, with in games in this World Cup, we're seeing when the there's a big team and there's an underdog, we're seeing a bit of a game to have there. And Japan, certainly in the second half, they were very strong. They got the two goals and they went on to win it against one of the favorites to win the World Cup, Germany. Yeah. Moriasu's tactics in that game were spot on. Even though in the first half, they considered a lot of chances to Germany, the idea was there that even if we go 1-0 down, we can keep that 1-0 and then we'll make this a 30-minute game if we have to. And then the substitutions like bringing on Asanu, changing to a back three at halftime, by bringing on Tomiyasu, who were really, really effective in pinning Germany back. Also, the fact that Germany's defense, which was a huge concern we had about them, you know, they didn't help themselves, especially for our second goal. Yeah, and with Germany, how much of pressure is Hansi Flick on right now? Because we know what happens to them in the last World Cup. They didn't make it out of the group. Mm -hmm. Blake had a wonderful time at Bayern Munich. He was expected to change the dynamic of this German national team. And now they find themselves in a similar situation because if they lose against Spain, they're packing their backs home. It's over. Yeah, so... Yeah, he's on, I don't think you'll get sacked if they get knocked out there because you have to... You can't stand that changing managers all the time. It's not going to help you. But yeah. going out by match day two... Is obviously going to be a huge disappointment. I don't think, like in Germany, the press expected Germany to win this World Cup, but they definitely expected like some sort of progress from 2018 
and Euro 2020. And going out now will not be progress at all. It will be a regression, basically. Yeah, it will definitely be a regression. And speaking of progress, we're seeing great progress for Spain because uh, to the last World Cup and the last and Euro 2016, we saw a Spain that was very slow. We saw a Spain that was coming towards an end of an era. And in this World Cup, we're seeing a very youthful Spain. And we saw that in full display against Costa Rica, where they sort of rolled back the years to the Spain of like the 2010s and 2008s with scoring goals. I don't, I don't think Spain has scored as many goals in a World Cup in their history as compared to the seven they scored against Costa Rica. Um, should Spanish fans be excited about this team? Or is it a bit too early to be excited? Yeah, it's always a bit of both. I feel there's reason to be excited. And there's reason you have to also can calm your temperature emotionally, like Del Bosque used to do with the 2010 team. So there's definitely reason to be optimistic for a Spanish team. Like I said on the preview, it's a team with a lot of potential. And you saw it with different sorts of players chipping in with goals. And for Spain, that's where their World Cup hope will be decided because in terms of controlling a game, they will, out, they will outplay anyone in the tournament in that scenario. It's just about what they can do in the final third in terms of finishing. And scoring seven is a good indication that they might be different this time. Yeah, it might be. And they sure made Gary Neville look kind of silly because in the preview on ITV, I was talking about how Spain didn't have any goals in <laughs> and then they go and score seven. <laughs> uh, yeah. And Gary's goal Gina, was special. Gina. Yeah. Gary's goal was special. Like the way he finished it, it was like on some next Zinedine Zidane stuff. But <laughs> yeah, things are looking very good for Spain. For Costa Rica, I felt so sorry for Kelo Navas because he did his best. <laughs> his defense didn't well, happen. But the thing is that this is Kel Navas' first game in five months because he's a substitute in PSG to Donnarumma and he also had an injury. So to come back to this baptism of fire was just unfair. Before the game, I thought, okay, if Costa Rica are going to make things difficult for Spain, he's going to play a huge part in it. So I hope he's going to be rusty. And it turns out he was very rusty because I feel like the shot that Sensio had for his goal that if fully informed Kelly Navas would save that. Yeah, yeah I, felt, I felt the same way as well. And Costa Rica next up for them is Japan, so they will be hoping to change their fortunes in this World Cup. But we're going to move on to another high-flying team in the World Cup, which is England so far. And Olympia, I was really impressed with you by their performance and the manner in which they beat Iran. <laughs> To be honest, um, don't think I. They were, you know, definitely I think convincing at times, but then it's against Iran, you know. I didn't really feel they were challenged, you know, really to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and stuff to really take it seriously. So, I'm not going to measure them until you know this USA game because you know USA did look more threatening, I would say, for the most part against Wales. So this would definitely be a bigger test for them. Um, you know, lots of people getting their first goals, at least in the World Cup. Uh, Jude and Shaka, I think, also uh, Grealish as well. So yeah, definitely a lot of people like attacking wise. You know, lots to you know kind of look forward to in that regard. And uh, hopefully Kane is not injured or too seriously injured to you know continue playing because he was also my pick for. <laughs> High school scorer, but yeah. funny enough, I won't be surprised if Juru just comes and steals that. <laughs> yeah, it was my pick too, and I expected him to score a hat trick in games like this. But 100. what was your impressions? You mentioned Iran. What was your impressions of them in this game and them going forward? Because they're not going to play England for the rest of the tournaments, they would mm. hope. But do you still think there's a chance they can make a competition out of the second place between USA, Wales, and themselves? I don't think so. Personally, personally, I just feel they 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 offered, you know, some endeavor in, in some departments, I think. Yeah. I was on the left or right, they were more threatening in, in terms of their attack, but 
I don't think, you know, going forward that they do sort of pose a threat to the other teams, you know, Wales or USA um, when, they, when they face each other. So, again, you know, I think even what was it them that had the dubious penalty given to them as well at the end of the game? I was seeing like, okay, let's just give another goal and stuff like that. So, it, it, you know, I, yeah, that they might be lucky to even get one point in this, uh, you know, group. Wow. So it's definitely going to be between the USC and Wales who will be fighting for second place, in your opinion. And how did you see their game, USA against Wales? Like, which one do you think has the edge in that race for second place? To be honest, I think USA, they they really showed a lot of energy and drive going forward. Um, they, I think, with a, a few more, a few better decisions, um, you know, going forward, I think they would have, they would have been maybe 2-0 up, you know, going into the the first, or going to the second half uh the game so i think they're a relatively young squad as well so they, they will sort of learn from this experience as a whole and come back better from it but yeah. uh yeah and do you have any player that impressed you in that game oh yeah uh what's that guy's name yeah the striker oh where where yes he where? he is he, he seems like, he's like, you know, get him the ball and he can make something happen. And they'll pull this is sort of, you know, put him in for the goal and everything. But, you know, he was, yeah, a very sort of key, you know, driving force for them going forward. And uh, I expect, you know, him to sort of continue that same vein. And yeah, do son, yeah, son of George Ware, a Ballon d'Or winner who, incidentally, never played in a World Cup because he was playing for Liberia during his playing mm. time. But another player who was close to not playing for a World Cup was Gareth Bell, and he made his appearance in a World Cup on the big stage with scoring that penalty. Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, any sort of key set piece, he's going to be the man behind that. So not not surprised. Um, I'm trying to remember if the tackle, if the, like, if the penalty was deserved. Was it... Uh, Someone kicking someone's leg in the box, I think. Yeah. Or was, it, was that the one where I can't remember? Some of the games sort of blur into each other sometimes. <laughs> yeah, there have been so many games, but he gets the penalty and he converts it. And yeah. how big of a legend do you think Bill is in Wales? Because everything Wales has accomplished internationally, he's been at the center of it. Yes, there might be better players like Best or Giggs, if you consider that, but like, Bill internationally for Wills throughout his career has just been the monster for them. Hundred percent. I I don't I, I think it's not a far fetched statement to say he is their most influential player ever, just in their at least in their uh you know um nation's kind of history in, you know for uh, international competition essentially. But yeah, he is he has been key for them so so many times. I'm not being key goals um, for them. I think probably he and Ronaldo are the people that have contributed, you know, like the largest portion of their team's goals, you know, like coming into this competition as well. So when you, you know, those people, you know, take them out of the squad and they're more or less toothless in, in many regards. So like I said, he, he, he has become a legend for them and, you know, him, scoring the first goal for them, you know, being back in the World Cup since, what, 1950-something? 50 58, I think? Yeah. Uh, it, it's been a while, so, you know, he's definitely, he definitely deserves, you know, to be up there for them. Yeah. It was 1958, the last time Wales appeared in a World Cup. It was 1986, the last time Canada appeared in a World Cup. And Oscar, how impressed were you by the performance of the Canadians against the Balkans? Yeah, I was really, really impressed with them. They showed a lot of energy, a lot of intensity, and they created a good number of opportunities, just that they were rather wasteful. And Belgium themselves didn't turn up, but took advantage of one moment of quality. 
But that yeah. said, I feel like Canada gave a really good account of themselves on the world stage. Yeah, I think they did as well. Because going into this game, I at first, I, like I discussed on this podcast, I was expecting, okay, Belgium will like blow away Canada. But then you look at the Belgian team and you're like, this is, isn't the second best team in the world, as their mm-hmm. favorite ranking suggests. <laughs> there are a lot of players over the hill. There are like nine players that I'm like, okay, these guys are out of form or they're just like overrated in general. And I, expect, I expected something from Canada, but I didn't expect it to be like, that good from them because in the first half it was a monologue from Canada. Exactly. But that's the cruel thing about football, isn't it? When you're at your best, <laughs> boom, one moment and you're holding your hands on your hips and it's like, what's going on? Yeah. And it feels worse when you know you get opportunities like the penalty, you don't take them, some good chances in front of goal, you don't take them. Some chances to play in a teammate, you don't do that. But yeah, overall, it feels frustrating. But the performance will at least give you that belief to say, okay, there's six points left against, okay, is the number two ranked team in the world? But I think Croatia are better. But yeah, definitely, you can look at those games and say, we can try and get something from them. Yeah, definitely can. And just to, to talk about the penalty, there was second about Fonso Davis, who, like, for the life of me, I really wanted him to score that because he's done so much to put Canada on the map in football speaking. And just missing that penalty was just heartbreaking. I feel most Canadians felt the same way mm-hmm. because of what he's done to like build that country up and the story of coming as a refugee, mm-hmm. um, moving through the ranks of Vancouver, getting that big into Bayern Munich and exploding on the world stage. Yeah, and Olympia wants to make a point on that. Yeah, I think the pressure of the moment really got to him. Um, just the, the the penalty, he, he just, you know, he didn't pick a side. You know, he just sort of played it, hoping the keeper would maybe have made his mind up beforehand so he could, like, slot it the other direction. So he definitely, he definitely didn't have any conviction playing that. And it's a huge moment for him. I just, you know, hope he's able to bounce back and, uh, you know, play better. Personally, I also think as well he shouldn't be on the right-hand side. He you know, in, he doesn't spend much of his you know, club career you know, in those sort of positions. So s- slotting him in that uh, manner, hoping that he can utilize, you know, cutting in on his left doesn't, I don't know, doesn't, doesn't seem like the best tactical move in my opinion. So maybe just kind of put him on the left, let him, you know, Pull more people and you know provide passes and cross into, into the box for other people to get on the end of them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good point, well taken. And Oscar, we, we had discussions concerning Canada during that during the game. And one thing we discussed was Canada's approach, where mm-hmm. they weren't like full on with the high press. And I felt they should have sat back and waited for Belgium and gone on counterattack because Belgium have the slower defenders. Do you think going into the Croatia game, that's an approach they should take? Because the one thing that Canada showed in terms of weaknesses was whenever Belgium played the ball over the top, they really struggled with that. And that's where the goal came from. Yeah, I feel the approach against Croatia should be more mature because I felt sometimes against Belgium, they were too over exuberant. And that gave Belgium lots of space. And they too had a bad day in front besides that finish from Batshuayi because there's a lot of bad decision-making from both teams. Yeah. I feel like with the Croatia that has an informed Luka Modric, Kovacic, Brozovic, that they are going to find utilize those spaces better than Belgium did. So I feel like kind of if you take a more mature approach and just play the game in sections, you know, see what you have by halftime. And then if you can go gung-ho against Croatia, when they've run out of ideas, then do that. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of Belgium, they were hugely disappointing in this game from their point of view. In the second half, I felt they were better. They played more maturely. I felt they had, that's when they really fully exploited Canada in the counterattack. Mm-hmm. How would they see this game going forward? Would they see it as, okay, this was a potential banana skin that we escaped from? But if we beat Morocco, we still have a chance of doing something big. 
in this tournament? Yeah, yeah, the thing is that it doesn't matter how you start the World Cup. What matters is how you finish. So at least from their point of view, they can be like, and we all agree that they were not good besides Courtois, but they'll say, okay, we weren't good, but we got three points. So this is hopefully something we can improve on. And if we beat Morocco when the round of 16, then from there, your third game is practically a layup depending on other results. So I don't know if the was the right time, but you, you guys know <laughs> what I mean. Yeah. It's, uh, basically, it's like a chance to just grow into the tournament more and more and peak, hopefully, at the right time. Yeah, it is. And the Croatia-Morocco game ended 0-0, which is good for Canada and Belgium because mm-hmm. both of them, that's a fantastic result. Because for Canada, if they somehow find a way to sneak out a result against Croatia and then they have that game against Morocco, it means they could go through. And for Belgium, as we mentioned, win against Morocco, they go through. Yeah, definitely. You know, when you lose your first game, you have to get the calculator out and turn into <laughs> a mathematician, a permutator, a what if. Yeah. But yeah, it's like a lot of things can happen in this group. And that's what's making this one, this one of the more interesting groups. Yeah, it definitely is one of the more interesting groups. We're going to move on to a less so interesting group, maybe uh, France. But I'm going to bring you back in. They were super impressive against Australia. They started, it seems like they were going to be one of those teams that clocked in the first round, but they came back into it. Olivier Giroud is now the all-time top scorer joined with Thierry Henry, two former Arsenal players. Um, I never imagined seeing Giroud as the top scorer of the French national team, but all credit to him. He deserves it. It's funny because... He definitely isn't as prolific as um, Henri would is or was, but uh, it's funny. He's he's actually done it in less games as well, like you know, in less appearances for France, which is again crazy to imagine. I I, I in my mind, I'm I'm tempted to think that you know maybe early on in Henri's days, he would maybe get stopped off, you know, and not play the whole game. But it seems like, um, what's the coach's name? Frank Leblanc, right? Yeah, yeah. He he like, oftentimes he would allow you know Giroud play the whole like ninety minutes, which obviously sort of gets him more opportunities and you know, more bites at the cherry in that regard. But credit to him, like he has, you know, he has sort of you know in, in the shadow of Benzema. To a large degree, made a name for himself in the front in the French team, and and it's crazy because, like you said, joint with Thierry Henry, and oh, very much likely to break that record, and probably, you know, unless only probably Mbappe, you know, can probably on pace to break that record, but he has done well, and credit to him. Uh, and after seeing this game, are you more confident in your stance that France will be one of the favorites for this tournament? Yeah, hundred percent. I especially because of the the opponents they have in in their in the group wouldn't necessarily challenge them. If I'm being honest, where they I think they could stay in like third gear for the most part and get through this group and you know. Kind of see where the chips fall in terms of who they face face next in the round of sixteen, and then you know how to maybe ramp it up or down. But yeah, they're very much in a good position. It's a shame they lost uh, um, Lucas Hernandez. Yeah, it doesn't seem like he would feature for the rest of the tournament. But you know his brother's more than able, willing to step in. Who might actually be better going forward? I think his Lucas Hernandez is better defensively, but Theo is definitely a lot more, you know, useful, I'll say, going forward. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. And we also saw goals from Mbappe, who's, and he also set up a goal. I'm going to bring in Oscar to talk about Antoine Griezmann, because you've seen a lot of him this season, and he mm-hmm. played a different position for Atletico, and he's bringing fruit for France, right? Yeah. He was really good this match, the end. I've seen praise from him on Twitter that he was among the La Liga players that played in the World Cup so far that he was probably the best performer. And I'd say I can agree with that because he, 
his role for France is really, really important. Even no matter how out of form he has been for Atleti sometimes or Barca, for France, he's just a different animal. This system would not be the same without him. That's just the truth. Because Mbappe, Dembele, Giroud, or Benzema, whoever, they really profit a lot from a player who's as cooperative and as unselfish as Griezmann is. Yeah, they really do. And back to you, Lemday. Speaking of looking at the France group right now, as you mentioned, France are heads and shoulders above everyone else. I was slightly disappointed with Denmark not getting that job done against Tunisia. Who do you see going through out of Tunisia, Australia, and Denmark? Yeah, to be honest, I think I the Denmark Tunisia game might be contender for one of the least you know entertaining games so far in in the world cup um, where's the mexico poland actually no that that, that <laughs> actually takes the cake that takes the cake. but at least there i think there was a missed penalty right but yeah. else, so yeah. it's like okay at least there was you know a chance for a goal you know like at least and you expect you know the Wondowski to put it away in that regard but like you said they were disappointing denmark and um to be honest with you, is a is a is a massive toss up, and like any one of them, like all the other three, could kind of turn up and win it. Like Tunisia, I wouldn't be surprised if you know. I think they're facing what Australia next, so if they just you know smash and grab sort of thing, get yeah. get a one one nil win, and then now just have to sort of keep their face against. <laughs> Uh, France and everything, which obviously would be hard to do because I know then Australia and Denmark would be going at it for the final game of the of the of that group. So, to be honest with you, my money I wouldn't bet on either, like any of them, any of the other three, like to finish second. Yeah, I think I'm still going to go for Denmark. I I, I think so, just because yeah. they have the players, and you never know. Maybe the quality will just show up someday. But let's move on to a group I think is the group of death which is Portugal's group. And boy, oh boy, we're Portugal lucky. <laughs> they got away with something. <laughs> and I'll start with a penalty that mm. started this old goal fest. Mm. It wasn't a penalty. That wasn't. Oh, yeah, it definitely wasn't. <laughs> but hey, you, you, if, you don't, if you don't buy a ticket, you don't win the raffle, as I said, right? So he yeah. bought the ticket and the <laughs> Yeah, allow me to push back though. In a world of VAR, right? Mm. That shouldn't stand as a penalty. He barely touches him. No, 100%. And I'm really shocked that the referee didn't even. It's almost like he turned off his his audio set to be like, no, 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 I'm not checking. I'm not like, I'm, I'm, I, I've seen everything I can see. Ronaldo got tackle, fell down, penalty. Right, that's all I want. You know, it seemed, yeah, definitely too good to be true in that regard. But uh, I feel for Ghana, like in terms of you know that definitely wasn't uh you know deserved penalty, and I mean it should be fair, Ronaldo should have taken one or two of his chances yeah. um, early on. If you think about it as well, I think the chance where the goal where he scored, where it was given that he fouled the defender, yeah, was relatively soft as well. I'm not saying it sort of cancels each other out in a sense, but I'm kind of saying that it does. <laughs> <laughs> it does. After that, Ghana did get an equalizer, but then two sucker punches from Joao Felix and Rafael Leal made made it seem that Portugal had it under control, but Ghana gave Portugal a late scare. Mm. Yeah, that that was that was very. <laughs> if it, there's, a, there's a video I think I saw on Twitter or something with like Ronaldo's reaction or just like the highlights of Ronaldo's reaction it was like telling him to kick it down the field to like the corner and then you see him realize that oh shit this man just got like the ball picked up and his hand is like on his head and everything and then it's just a shame that Inak Williams slipped at the vital moment yeah, the worst for Ghana. like that is so sad that, that he probably doesn't believe it no like, yeah and it's like big he he got pretty much signed for moments like this. And Oscar, Oscar, you want to say something about this? Yeah, Ki Williams <laughs> failing to score at the vital moment is you could not get any more in Yaki Williams. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah. so, I'm, so, I'm sorry, but 
Yeah. Uh, uh, that whole sequence was just too funny. I feel the the Costa should be lucky. Yeah, Williams slipped. Otherwise, he'd be on the way home now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, Ronaldo okay. like shout him down. No, like, Ronaldo, Ronaldo won't let this guy leave the picture. Like, forget on the way home. <laughs> 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 if you're on the way to your hospital. <laughs> yeah, Oscar and I watch a, like we've seen a lot of Iñaki Williams from La Liga, and that's like typical Iñaki Williams. This one was just too cruel. <laughs> yeah, it was. It really was. I, I I really feel for him in this first World Cup game. I think as well. So. But the good news for Ghana is Uruguay and South Korea drew. So there's still a chance Ghana maybe gets their revenge against Uruguay for 2010, right, Illumination? Yeah, 100%. I think just looking at their performance as well against Portugal, right, I think they gave the best account of themselves. Like, again, when you look at Uruguay and um, South Korea and how their match sort of ended up, yeah, and Ghana gave it a very good account of themselves. So they can feel, you know, um, very good going into, the, you know, their next matchup. And, you know, if not for the slip, like, like you guys said, um, they would be, you know, one point shared and then going into the uh, next game, looking for, you know, to snatch all three points and then hopefully maybe clinch the, the top of the group. Yeah, yeah, hopefully maybe do that. And also with South Korea and Uruguay, where do you see them like ranking after that draw? Well, I think it's going to be interesting to see how they sort of, you know, face up with each other, uh, with the next teams, I think. Okay, so Portugal is facing Uruguay next, and then yeah. South Korea is facing Ghana. It's going to be a big game. Uruguay not Portugal out in the last World Cup. So I think Uruguay will be doing everything to not lose that game. A draw, and they will feel, okay, we can just, just you know, throw caution to the wind against Ghana. So South Korea, I think, would be looking at this game against Ghana as a must-win yeah. because, you know, going to Portugal, I think every every other team would see Portugal as you know, the, you know, A side or the, you know, Goliath in this situation. So um, they will try to get as much of, you know, pound of their own pound of flesh as they possibly can. But, yeah, they, uh, yeah. Yeah, they definitely will be. And Oscar, we're going to move on to the Canarias, the Brazilians. They were, they were dancing over Serbia today. Richarlison scored. Wow. That bicycle kick was something special. Yeah, it was it was absolutely special. I gave it go of the tournament so far. <laughs> and yeah, he the his performance was special because it what well, it came as Brazil really needed the way to break Serbia down. Because Serbia and their goalkeeper, hold on, let me not murder his name. <laughs> that we have to take our time here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, we take names very Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Van Jamie Linkovic Savage. Yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway, he was really good today and he denied Brazil so many times. But Richardson found it that they could to beat him and then scored that beautiful goal. And that goal was so Brazil, so Jogo Bonito. And yeah, they're dancing over there. Yeah, and they're, they're proven everyone writes in that they are favorites to win this. Like, they're the main favorites to win this tournament. And you look at the lineup they had today where you have Neymar clean as a 10, Paqueta and Casemiro behind him. And Paqueta is, like, more of an attacking midfielder. And you think to yourself, like, wow, this is crazy attacking. And then you have a front three of Rafinha, Richarlison, and Vinicius. This is... I haven't seen a lineup this offensive in a long time. Yeah, that's Tite for you. Like he's even in Copa America, he's ne- he always plays four forwards and just two midfielders. Today he was actually, like you said, more attacking than usual because normally it's Fred that yeah. lines up alongside Casemiro. But then he's like, okay, Serbia are probably going to defend deep against us. So I need all the creativity I can get on the pitch. Yeah, and Olympe, what do you think about this crazy attacking formation? Do you think this is going to hurt Brazil in the long term? I think based on um, 
the I guess the um, you know tactics that they are potentially going to face would determine how you know they would shape up. Um, like uh, Osa said that the or like Oscar said so the the fact that Serbia was sort of sitting back and sort of trying to soak up the pressure, hoping to maybe counter attack Brazil was the reason why he felt that okay the more attacking you know creative power I have on the pitch the better we will be you know to be able to like you know create chances and take them I was, I was going to make a comment in regards to I think the attacking formation like you said and I think France also had a similar setup where they had you know okay I, I guess they had like four almost sort of frontline men yeah and Guzman Dembele and Bappi and Giroud on the yeah. pitch at the same time, I was like, well, who's doing defending? I guess yeah. it's like Jimeno was just kind of sat at the back and then Rabio was making the transition between, you know, defense and attack. Yeah, but the thing though is I feel the difference between France and Brazil is that Griezmann has that work ethic based on mm-hmm. being in that Chilo Simeone school for a long time to be that defender that I don't think, I don't see Neymar putting in that level of work. No. Yeah, but... Vinicius, Rafinha, did, Rafinha especially, they have really good work rates. Yeah. Richarlison is pretty happy to just slot back in and leave Neymar up front if need be. Yeah. But yeah, it will be interesting to see how Brazil's ultra attacking system, which I really like, is refreshing to yeah. see in this day and age, <laughs> how they do against some of these European tactical teams that will try and be looking for ways right now to exploit that if they should meet Brazil. Yeah. And, and maybe that's the future of like football. Maybe that's the next tactical innovation that we see, like teams just going all out attack or like five forwards. And, yeah. And that, that, but you need the quality to do that. And, uh, look at the people Brazil brought on. Yeah. Rodrigo, Anthony, Gabriel Jesus, Gabriel Martinelli. Like, not everyone can do Not everyone is built that way. No. Never in this book that way, but poor old Serbia, like they must be feeling super jaded after that. But the good news for them is they don't have to play Brazil again for a while, so they have some matchups coming up. Um, Switzerland, they got the job done, they beat uh, Cameroon. Onana couldn't do anything to save them. But the news about the Switzerland game is Brill and Bolo, who was born in Cameroon, scored against his home country, which is super crazy. And yeah. uh, and we're both Africans on this podcast. Like, what do you guys think about the fact that some African players choose to play for other countries other than their home country? Mm. I don't really think much of it. I feel yeah. if you get the opportunity to play for the best possible team you can, then you should take it. Yeah, It was funny to see a player <laughs> not so British going to World Cup out of respect. I don't think I've seen that one before. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's almost like you see that in club football. I'm like, I'm not gonna sound afraid. But you gave Switzerland the favoritism for second in this in this group, and it seems like you're gonna be right, Oscar. Well, I don't mean to pat myself on the shoulder, but <laughs> it looks like it's especially if Serbia do this strange thing of not using all their weapons, because I felt like the likes of Vlaovic and Kostic could have been used today, but they didn't make the start, so I'm guessing maybe they're being saved for the more winnable games yeah. from a Serbia point of view. Yeah. And I'll, I'll love to see Vlaovic in this tournament because he's, for me, I think is one of the hottest strikers in Europe. And mm-hmm. I feel he will be the person that can make a difference for Serbia. Exactly. Yeah. Finally, let's move on to the host. And they started off as World Cup. And they failed to live up to expectations. I think they're the first host in World Cup history. Not to lose. To lose. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. That that's outstanding. But yeah, we have to give it to Ecuador. Like all credit to them. They they came into this game. They played really well. They dazzled in the first half, and they just got the job done. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the quality gap even within Ecuador and Qatar was pretty clear. And Qatar, I feel like they started the first half really nervously, giving the ball away because of the, you know, like you said, the big occasion and whatnot. Yeah. And 
right from the start, Ecuador really went for them, had the goal disallowed, and Valencia eventually got two. And Qatar didn't really do much to try and get back into the game, which is worrying because you you'd say Ecuador at the out of Ecuador, Senegal, and Netherlands that Ecuador might be the weakest, and then they absolutely outplayed you. So you're going to have to bring your absolute best against Senegal. Yeah, and the worry is for Qatar is like they might not even score a goal in this World Cup. The amount of oh, yeah. points, it's. I feel it will be possibly the worst host in history of this world. Well, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree with you. If they score a goal, I'll be absolutely shocked. But hey, this World Cup is a World Cup for surprises. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Do you think they'll score a goal in the World Cup? Oh, I definitely don't think that. But, uh... <laughs> Um, unless there's some sort of a gift of a penalty they get given at some point, I don't know. Maybe handball that isn't, you know. But um, you know, it was just a crazy thing to imagine when they said um, the fact that they lost that game. They are apparently the first host nation to ever lose their first game <laughs> in the Not world. Not even Cup South game. Africa did that. Exactly. Like, like it's if you think about that, that's a crazy stat, and it's just like, well, you know. You, this is the bed you know you laid. Now you have to laugh. <laughs> uh, that's what I was going to say before I said, you know what? Let me just let the sleeping dog lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm surprised they didn't sign enough Brazilian players like cover for the fact. That... <laughs> yeah, the, the oh. near more Brazilians do we. <laughs> teams in Ukraine do it, uh, teams in Bulgaria. But anyway, maybe for the next World Cup. Yeah, maybe for the next World Cup if they do make it through, but. Let's talk about Senegal, though. Um, I've, I've been very critical of Edouard Mendy in the last 12 months, and he showed why, because I feel this guy somewhat deceived all of us, that he's a great goalkeeper. And his hands were at fault for both goals, I felt, against the Netherlands. Uh, definitely the first goal. The second goal, I feel like you save it, and then it goes to the part of class. M. But the first goal, the lack of judgment and everything is just so poor, especially from a goalkeeper that supposedly hashtag the best <laughs> FIFA and their awards. Eh? Yeah. But yeah, it's, 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 he's made some absolute howlers in the last few months. Yeah, and it's a soccer blow for Senegal. And I really hope they go, I really hope they go through because I, I admire the coach. But And the good thing for them, I feel, is that Ecuador is going to play in Netherlands. Yeah, and they're going to play in Qatar because I feel if you're if you're there to play Ecuador, they would have been put in such a situation of stress that maybe they would have lost that game. Yeah, but now they're going to play Qatar. Hopefully, they get like a good result, maybe a four zero or something. They get the morale up, mm-hmm. and they set up for an amazing final against Ecuador. Yeah, and maybe maybe Ecuador beats Netherlands. We're we're giving Netherlands too much credit here. Uh, yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's not sleep on Ecuador, honestly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what about the Dutch? Did they impress you, Oscar? Uh, I, I don't really, I can't really say they, were, they looked much better in Senegal. Yes, they deserve to win, but then I'll just use one player to exemplify how I feel how the Dutch played Frankie de Jong. Sometimes he was very good, sometimes he was awful with how he was. <laughs> Just get, causing turnovers and just playing hide the snake with the ball in zone box. <laughs> so yeah, it was. It, it's but eventually that's the thing. They got yeah. the job done, and when the pie came on, who is a key player for them, they got a lot better, and that's where I feel the quality gap between them and Senegal should. So having a fully fit the pie for the rest of the tournament should do wonders for Netherlands' chances of making it out of this group. Yeah, as you spoke about Frankie the Young, guys, I thought about that famous Gattuso quote. <laughs> that I cannot so, repeat on air. I mean, I, I, that, to refer to Frankie, that ball was, that assist was delicious. It's, but it just gave me nostalgia of the last one he gave for Barcelona before this break. Yeah, to our yeah. And yeah. Olimde, what about you? Do you fancy the Dutch to finish first in this group? Yeah, I do. I 
I think they definitely had some lucky breaks. But uh, looking at the rest of the teams, I think they they definitely put themselves in the best position, I would say. And, you know, they do have players, you know, like Oscar said, that can turn it up. Let's just hope they don't sort of, you know, have too many low points in, in the game. You know, but they do have the most promise, I would say, in that group. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Before, before I let you guys go, gentlemen, I'm just going to do a segment that we usually do on this podcast. So now we've seen a full match day of the World Cup. Who do you think has been the best player and the best team? Starting with Olympe. The best player. Huh. The best player. I'm tempted to say, fun, funny enough. Ah, oh, damn. Okay. So I, I I know I don't know like most of their names, but is this South Arabia's number ten? Yeah, I was literally gonna say, it. and the the best player that in that Saudi Arabia game, I, I can't remember the, his name, but that whoever, like yeah, that that I think was the biggest upset, you know, in in this World Cup so far. So yeah. credit goes to them, you know, to 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 come and no one expected anything from them. But, uh, to, to do that is definitely that number 10 takes it for me. Oh, the sorry. Salah. Okay. Salah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so, yeah, he takes it for me. Um, and they said best team. I mean, it's, it's hard to look beyond Spain at this point. Uh, just, I didn't expect them to be as balanced as they looked. I know um, they were your original pick to win um, Taj. Yeah. So then you then said your heart says Brazil, <laughs> but it, it was just very balanced, and it, you know it seems like I guess Tiki Taka is alive again, in, you know, in the in the players that they have now. So it, it's it's going to be an interesting, you know, see how far they can take this going forward. Yeah, you Oscar. Uh, I think for best player, I'll say Gavi because he was really good in midfield and he scored that great goal. For best team, well, I'd like to pick Spain. I'd say I'd give it to Saudi Arabia because hey, no one can tell me they expect us Saudi Arabia to win. I'm not going to have it. You're lying. <laughs> <laughs> You're lying. I, everyone I, 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 everyone I expected I saw it in a dream. <laughs> <laughs> everyone expected a blowout and they proved us all wrong. So much credit to Saudi Arabia for doing that. And yeah. I hope they enjoyed their holiday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, really hope they do. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll agree with you there. I told a friend of mine who's from Saudi Arabia because it was hyping up being on Instagram, and I was like, eight zeros coming in. Famous last words. Yeah, famous last words. I'd have to get to Saudi Arabia as well. I just feel they've been, they were super brilliant. I love the way they tactically organized themselves against Argentina. Yeah. And, yeah, we have to talk about that. It was like, when you think out, it, like, why would you do a high press against a team that has Messi, who, can, who has laser-like vision? But then it worked because they caught Argentina offside so much that I felt Morata was playing for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's cool, a, and then that high press, what it also did was that the space for Messi to operate between the lines was not there at all. So they really did their homework and got it right. And Maybe that's a blueprint for the smaller teams this tournament. Yeah. Play high line. Forget our pacing behind. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And yeah, maybe that's what Canada was trying to do that we criticize mm-hmm. them so much for. And mm-hmm. I feel for best play, I'm gonna have to go with Richarlison, just given how we took Brazil to another level. And yeah, so it's been it's been an exciting match day one, guys. Thank you so much for this discussion. And I hope to see you guys after match day two. Adios. No problem. Adios. Adios.